One of the things that I think that is really important for us to do is to go back and uh, look at what we did last week to try to answer the simple question of what is our political response. And so last week, it's very important to understand before I share these, Foothills is uh, not trying to, our vibe is not to tell people what to think or who to vote for, that kind of stuff. It's to give you the critical thinking skills for you to think clearly, make decisions, and so that you can grow your faith, because that's what this is all about. And I presented four major major responses that the church in general in America is currently propagating or pushing or invested in. And the first one is the Benedictine option. And this is based uh, on uh, St. Benedict, the monk, uh, and a guy by the name of Ron Dreyer wrote a book called The Benedictine Option. So he came up with the phrase, and he advocates that the church basically withdraw from society. Uh, the second one is called the Charlemagne Option. I named it that because Charlemagne was the king of the second Holy Roman Empire. In the 6th, 7th, and 8th century, he reestablished all of Europe under one throne that he was on. And so they call that the Holy Roman Empire, the second one. And what he did, though, is he had a law where if you weren't baptized, they would kill you. So if they found out that you weren't baptized, you could be put to death. We call this in today's world is that, wow, if we could just have all the power and be in control, then everything would be fine. So the church should try to get more power. The third option is all things to all people. And this is basically that, no, our goal is to just love everybody and not make any judgments on anybody. So everything they do is acceptable, right? And we're just supposed to accept and affirm everything. And then the last one is don't pick the sides option. And this is popularized uh, most specifically recently by Andy Stanley, who is a pastor of a very, very large church in the Atlanta region. They have like between 30 and 40,000 people that attend their five campuses on a Sunday. Pretty massive. And he writes a lot of bestseller books. He's invited to speak at a lot of uh, significant leadership conferences and stuff like that. He's been to the White House and to give counsel, things like that. He wrote a book called Not In It to Win It. When the church picks sides, the church is sidelined. This is a map of a little town called Caesarea Philippi. And you'll notice this is the Sea of Galilee right down here where Jesus did most of his ministry. And for some reason, he decided to take a big march up to Caesarea Philippi. Why did he decide to do that and take his disciples there? Well, here is why. Because you will see it is a... We went there on a tour there. Pastor Harv took us. And there's uh, Mr. Zimmerman right there uh, marching through. That over there is the grotto. This is called the, the uh, Stadium of Pan or the Studio of Pan. This is some more areas of ruins. You can see an old Roman colonnade there. Uh, in the next one, you'll see a little bit more people walking around. This is the grotto, they call it. They believe that that was the, the way in which you got to Hades. Okay, you see some people standing around. If you look closely, Pastor Harv will be teaching and leading. It's awesome. Uh, there's Dan Frisky. Woohoo! And there's my son, Zach, right there, you know, looking good. Uh, so th this kind of looks out from where that grotto comes, you know, out over this huge area. It's really nice. And the reason that that's important is because that grotto, what happened is uh, they believed it was the, the gate or the doorway into Hades, the underworld. Hades was the brother of Zeus in Roman mythology or paganism, and he was the god over the underworld. And they put a gate there because once he got a hold of you, you didn't want people from the underworld being able to come back and torment you, okay? That was a big deal to them. So there was, a, there was gates there for that. And he goes, who do you say I am? And Peter says something that is seminal in all Christianity. He says at that moment, you are the son of God the Messiah. You are God over all of these gods. You are the Lord. That is a big thing. And listen to what Jesus says based on that. Verse 17, Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Up to this point, he's always known as Simon. 
It has a, a, a kind of a, a flavor of passionate and engaged. That's kind of what that name is. He goes, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. So this is not a man truth. He goes, it was revealed by my Father in heaven. This is a revelatory truth from God, your creator. I tell you that you are now Peter. So he changes his name from Simon to the Greek word or name Petra, which means rock. He says, and on this rock, not the rock of Peter, but see, he changed Peter's name to rock because he got the revelatory truth that was given to him by God that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He says, I will build what? My church and the gates of Hades, the God of Hades, the brother of Zeus, God of the underworld, even the gates of hell will not overpower or overcome it. This is a seminal it is a primary source text that states that the church, ecclesia, that's a Greek word for church, people called out. It is a community of people called out by Jesus in his name, and it belongs to him. He uses the possessive pronoun my. This is my church, okay? Now, the second main passage, if you flip to the end of this gospel, according to Matthew, to chapter 28, this is right after Jesus rises from the dead for a period of about 47 days. He appears to over 500 different people in bodily form. And in one of those situations before he ascends into heaven, he addresses his disciples. In verse 18, he says this, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, authority is a big deal uh, to these first century thinkers because they live in a totalitarian state, Rome. It's all about authority. Gods have authority and gave the Roman Caesars their authority. And Jesus is now has authority over everything on heaven and on earth. And because of that, that's the word therefore. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, the word nations there is the Greek word ethna. So he says, panta, meaning all, ethna. So the word is ethnic in English. So what is he saying? We are to go to all ethnicities. Okay, so he says, go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all right? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the earth. So this is a very important passage. It says that Jesus has all authority and the mission that he gave you and I as the church here on earth is to go and make disciples. And if you remember, Jesus talked all the time about seed planting and harvesting, right? Half the parables are about planting seeds or crops or something and harvesting. It was an agrarian culture. In Jesus, in chapter uh, 15 of the gospel, according to John, verse 5, he said, I am the vine, meaning I'm the tree trunk. You are the branches. If you remain in me, grafted into me, and I remain in you, we're connected, you will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So Jesus spoke of this all the time, all about fruit. You plant a seed, produces a crop. Tree is known by its fruit, what it produces. This is called upstream principle. And that is, I have to start with the condition of my heart, my core values, because my core values determine my morality. My morals determine my society or my culture. And my culture determines the political outcome. Okay? That's very important to understand. What values should you then expect in your church? Based on its mission and based on these things, what values should your church have? Well, number one, you want the church to focus on leading people to Jesus and discipling them to maturity. Why? So you can be a part of God's mission in this world. So you can personally discover your own mission in life. You can be discipled to maturity.
If you are involved in politics and if you care about politics, you want a church that is fired up about leading people to Jesus and discipling them to maturity because it makes your life so much easier than anything else. Just think for a moment. Right now in America, when you distill all of the survey and the data and the census and everything, you boil it all down, people take this stuff seriously and really objectively and scientifically, they say that 20% of the population in America America are committed Christians. Just 20%. Some argue it's between 18.5%. So it's right in that area. Okay? That represents 65 million people who are committed followers of Christ. Okay? Taking out the kids. So what would happen if those 65 million people over the next three years or four years went out and found just one person and discipled that person to maturity in Christ? I'm not doing this to recruit you into a political movement. I'm not doing this for that. I just want you to meet Jesus personally. I want you to know what he taught, what he said, and I want you to be fully devoted to him. If 65 million people did that, that would turn out to be how many people? 130 million. Do you know how many people voted in the 2020 election? 155 million people. If you are serious about politics, and you think about politics, the best thing that you could do is have a church. You would want that passionately. I want my church to be on mission, fired up. I want to do everything I can because if the values way up there turn into morality and convictions there, that influences society and that makes my job so much more easier in what I'm trying to do. 